Hey again, y'all. What do you think of the new intro song? Does it give you shivers like it gives me? I reached out to Galen Lee, who is the musician who made that piece, to ask her for permission to use it in all videos in this series. And I was so happy when she said yes, hi, Nerisse, um, because not only is her music just hauntingly good, um, but she's also a wonderful disability justice self-advocate. So I feel that the theme of that song and of her music in general fits the theme of this series perfectly. You want to be in this, Nerys? Say hi to everyone. <laughs> For today, I'm focusing on the Hebrew Bible because I've got this guy, this guy's book, um, Saul M. Olyan. He wrote this book on disability in the Hebrew Bible. Um, and I think it's a good place to start to branch off from my first video where I talked about how um, the concept of disability is different, not only in different cultures, but even within the same culture, um, especially when you look at it over the course of a couple millennia. Um, there's not just one voice in the Bible um, when it comes to what the writers of the Bible and their societies thought about disability. So in this video, I just want to start with talking a little more about that. Some examples in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, that offer us different views on disability to help us really get this idea home um, that there are many voices. When we talk about what the Bible says about disability, we're not going to find just one answer. We're going to find a lot of answers, and some of them are kind of um, not happy news for people with disabilities, and then some of them are. Um, we can find good news in Scripture for people with disabilities if we just dig a little um, past some of the more negative conceptions of disability that we find. Um, the dominant perspective in the Hebrew Bible about disability is that um, it's a flaw and imperfection. And the reason behind this flaw varies depending on what part of the Bible you're looking at. So I'll get to that in a second. But let's talk about this idea of disability as imperfection or defect first. It's an idea that unfortunately I think is pretty big in our own cultures today. It's this idea that we can name a sort of perfect whole human body and that is, among many things, an abled body. In our culture, we could also say it's a male body that has a penis. It's a white body. In the Hebrew Bible, we can see that supposedly perfect body described in the rules for what a priest who worked in the temple could or could not look like. Priests were held to a much higher standard than the average person in ancient Israel because they would be working directly with God in the temple on behalf of the people. But there was a belief that for priests at least, um, in order to interact with God and like not die, um, be struck down because God's so holy, you have to be perfect in this um, sort of this sort of construct of what it means to be perfect. I think I actually brought this quote into the previous video, but it's sort of the main um, one of the main passages we can look at, listing out all the things that a priest cannot be. So let's read that text, and this is in Leviticus 21. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and say, No one of your offspring throughout their generations who has a blemish may appear to offer the food of his God. For no one who has a blemish shall draw near no one who is blind or lame, or one who has a mutilated face or a limb too long, or one who has a broken foot or a broken hand, or a hunchback or a dwarf, or a man with a blemish in his eyes, or an itching disease, or scabs or crushed testicles. No descendant of Aaron the priest who has a blemish shall come near to offer the Lord's offerings by fire. Since he has a blemish, he shall not come near to offer the food of his God. He may eat the food of his God, of the most holy as well as of the holy. But he shall not come near the curtain or approach the altar, because he has a blemish that he may not profane my sanctuaries. For I am the Lord, 
I sanctify them. So whew, we have this long list of what it might mean to have an imperfect body. And we have this idea that if someone with such a body were to approach the presence of God, um, the, the, that presence, the sacred space would be profaned somehow. Uh, and well, I don't think I need to spell out what that says about the belief here about disabilities and people with those disabilities. This idea that these people are, are imperfect, um, that they're flawed, excludes them from the sort of direct presence of God. So that's sort of one of the big overarching views we find in the Hebrew Bible, um, that to have a disability is a, an imperfection that God doesn't like, that would profane holiness. Um, and so for some of them, um, such as skin diseases or um, menstruation, which is, consi is not quite a disability, but is seen as a defect in a similar way. And that's why when people are going through menstruation, they're supposed to sort of ostracize themselves from the rest of society um, for the time that they're bleeding, and then they can come back. Um, if you have a skin disease and you get it dealt with and you purify yourself, um, you can stop ostracizing yourself and come back. Um, so for some people having these um, various defects, um, it's possible to get them cured, um, and purify yourself, and return to society. But for other people, um, certain, you know, there are disabilities that don't go away. And so what does that say about who you are, that you're, you're constantly imperfect, your prospects, your social prospects, your economic prospects are limited um, because of ableism, um, we would say nowadays. So I want to go a little bit into some of the examples of how your prospects might be limited because of your disability. Um, and then I want to share some alternative voices in scripture because I promised you that there is not just one voice, one opinion, one word on disability in the Bible. There are so many different points of view being voiced um, across this you know, couple of millennia that this big book was written. So throughout the Hebrew Bible and also in the New Testament, we have many, many examples of disability being linked to other supposed um, negative groups. Um, disability linked with femininity, which of course is negative and weak. Disability linked to immorality and weakness of character. Disability linked to dependence. I'll just share a few um, passages here and I'll probably link to like a whole list because there are so many um, and I bet you'll recognize the sort of setup from songs you might sing in churches. Um, so here we go. Psalm 38 says, As for me, like a deaf person I could not hear, and like a mute person I could not open my mouth. I was like a man who cannot hear, who has no recourse to retorts. Um, so it's this association of helplessness um, and defenselessness with being disabled. And then in Psalm 137, we find this passage. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget. May my tongue stick to my palate if I do not remember you, if I do not raise Jerusalem above my highest joy. So for the psalmist here, muteness is a curse. Um, and he asks for his right hand to forget, perhaps to forget how to function. Um, he want, he's, he's wishing this curse upon himself um, if he fails to remember Jerusalem. Um, and so he's relating disability to a curse. Um, he's thinking of it as sort of like a worst case scenario, like, oh, if I do this bad thing, may this really bad thing happen to me. Um, what does that say to people who are mute or who um, do have some sort of impairment in their hand? Um, that it's so bad that it could, be it could be wished upon someone as a curse. And then we have a lot of passages in scripture about sort of the day of the Lord. Um, when good things are going to come to, to Israel or to Judah at last. And there's a lot of passages in which people with various defects or disabilities are cured on this day. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a gazelle and the tongue of the mute shout joyfully. This idea that in order for disabled people to find joy, the joy and peace um, and inclusion and unity that comes on the day of the Lord. Um, they have to be cured of their disability. 
this idea that disability will be erased at this time can be a really harmful one to disabled people in our own day. It's this idea that the only way for a disabled person to live a happy life is if they could magically become abled. Yeah, so we, we see disability, um, disability is linked with all these negative things. And so I can only imagine if you grew up learning this stuff from your society and your holy books about disability and you yourself had a disability. Um, for example, say you're blind and you um, hear about how blindness is related to ignorance um, and refusing to see God or um, hear God. Um, you're probably going to have a pretty low opinion of yourself, potentially, and what you're capable of. And the people around you will probably have the same opinions, probably even worse than you do, that you're utterly dependent, you can't do anything for yourself, that you're not able to help other people. Um, does this sound familiar? Because to me, this is pretty close to how society reacts to people with disabilities today, that of course, they can only ever be dependent on others, nothing good can come of their disability. Um, we have that same idea um, in a lot of these passages, but in a lot of the stories in the Bible, we don't only see people with disabilities um, who are supposedly useless or weak or not able to be agents of God, um, that at best they can hope for God's blessing or God's cure. We also have heroes in scripture who have disabilities. And I'm not going to delve deep into any of their stories today because they're basically all going to get their own individual videos because we can dive real deep into them. But let me give some examples. We have, let's start with Isaac. Um, now in his youth, Isaac was not blind, but as he aged, he became blind. There's different points of view, and I'll get into this when I do his video. Some say, well, look, it's to show that he's aging, he's weak, he's able to be duped and tricked by his son because of his blindness. Um, there are some other um, points of view that say, but he's still highly respected and the leader of his family, and he has the power to give his blessing to whomever he chooses. Um, so his family is still relying on him and looking up to him. Um, then we have Jacob, the one who dupes Isaac into giving a blessing to him um, and also wrestles with God or some other heavenly being. It's unclear in the text, but he wrestles with this being and becomes disabled in that fight. Jacob um, walks with a limp for the rest of his life after that divine wrestling. We've got, um, we've got Moses. I, I wrote a whole paper on his disability. Um, he has some sort of speech impediment, and yet he becomes the voice of God for the enslaved nation of Israel and is God's agent who f frees the people. But yeah, we have so many different voices and stories in scripture um, about disability, and a lot of them are more negative. But we also have other voices that speak of this, these people as, peop um, as people, as agents of God's blessing to the world instead of only being objects. And we also have passages like Isaiah 56. But I'm going to leave Isaiah 56 for the next video, which I've actually already recorded, so it should come out pretty soon. I just got to transcribe it and all that. I want to leave it for the next video. Um, because one, I really want to emphasize Isaiah 6, 56 as one of, in my opinion, one of the most important passages in all of the Bible in general, but particularly for this idea of disability theology and finding good news for disabled people. So I'm going to leave that for that reason and also because I really want to keep these videos short. My eventual goal is to have an average video lasting only like 10 minutes. Um, the first few like this um, are a bit longer than that because I have to lay so much groundwork, but that's my hope is to make these a bit more bite-sized. So you can look forward to that video on Isaiah 56. In the meantime, I want to leave you with this food for thought. Um, if you learned nothing else from this video, I hope it's the idea that 
The Bible has many voices that when you go to find what the Bible says about any topic, including disability, you understand that there are cultural factors involved that while yes, I believe that the Bible is divinely inspired, that the Holy Spirit speaks to us through scripture and that scripture for me at least is sort of a framework for how I live my life. Um, at the same time, it's really important to recognize that God used human beings and that scripture is written by human beings and human beings have flaws and biases and we have prejudices and stereotypes and we are informed by our society and that means there is ableism in the Bible and that means that when we go to say okay so the Bible has some passages in which disabled people are somehow cursed or flawed um, they should all want to be cured um, they don't have a right to access to certain social spaces, but also religious spaces or to God's presence. We have those passages in the Bible, but that doesn't mean that God says that just because the Bible says that. But I hope that's what y'all's food for thought can be for this video, is just to ponder what it might mean for you or for your communities to consider the fact that the Bible has many voices. Um, the divine voice does ring loudest overall, but there's a lot of human voices in there too, and they all have different opinions. Um, what does that mean for you? And what might that mean for how you and your communities view disability? So that's it. I'll see you next time. It should be pretty soon.